Hey YouTube, this is Tom at TM Aquatics and I hope everyone's doing great. Today's video is going to be a follow-up to last week's video where I talked about a new technique that I was going to try to hatch Corydoras eggs. The results are in. Did it work? Did we have any success? You'll have to stick around for that. But I also want to share with you a brand new species of Corydoras that I picked up a few days ago at my LFS and I'm real excited to have them here at my fish room at TM Aquatics and I want to share those with you as well. So anyways, I do hope you stick around and check this one out. Alright YouTube, before we get too far into this video, I first want to give a big shout out and send my thoughts to Yuri from Pleco Ceramics. Yuri and Pleco Ceramics is located in eastern Ukraine in the Kharkiv area. Now, Yuri had been making regular posts on Instagram and Facebook. However, his most recent post was over 48 hours ago. In that post, Yuri mentioned that the building that his fish farm is in was hit by shells. Now, the good news is, according to Yuri's post, is that the building still had electricity, his fish farm is located in the basement, and everything was fine. But as you've probably seen, things in that region have escalated quite a bit, so I'm just concerned for Yuri, his family, his friends, everybody else in that area, and their safety. So, anyways, I'm just asking that you keep Yuri, Pleco Ceramics, everybody else in Ukraine in your thoughts. And with that, let's get on to the rest of this video. All right, YouTube, in last week's video, I talked about some of my challenges and setbacks that I've had in the fish room this year in regards to hatching out Corydoras. The fish have been doing their part. They've been spawning on a pretty regular basis, but I just haven't had a real high uh, success rate in terms of hatching and rearing the fry. Um, usually I've been seeing about a five to 10% survival rate, where historically I have anywhere from 50 to 75% survival rate. So I talked about using a new technique where I have these egg tumblers, these are Zis egg tumblers, in an empty 10 gallon aquarium. Now there's no biofilter in this aquarium, anything like that. I filled it with RO water uh, mostly and then added about 20% tap water just to add some minerals in the water and a little bit of buffering effect. I then added two katapa leaves or Indian almond leaves. Now, when I've talked to other Corydoras breeders in the past about using these types of tumblers, they've always cautioned that, you know, their concern would be the eggs hitting the side of the tumblers too much, that there would just be too much water flow through there, and the eggs hitting against the side of the tumbler could cause damage to the embryos, etc. But I don't really keep the flow up that high. Now, in these two tumblers in the front right here, those are empty right now. The flow going through there is a little bit heavier than what I would have them. Uh, if there were eggs in there. This other tumbler though does have some more Corydoras Kanaki eggs in there and I keep the flow pretty low as you can see. Not a lot of air coming up through there and as a result the eggs aren't really being bounced around too much. Uh, just enough to kind of keep them rolling or pushed up the sides or the edges a little bit in the egg tumbler itself. So a nice real easy gentle flow. Now, once I see that these eggs are starting to hatch, and these should start hatching tonight or tomorrow morning, um, then I'll turn that flow down even more. And then when about 30% of the eggs have hatched, I'll actually pull that tumbler out and transfer the fry and any unhatched eggs into a plastic container, which is what I did with the eggs in my previous video. As you recall, in these two first uh, egg tumblers in the front there, I had some Corydoras duplicarius eggs and I also had some Corydoras Kanaki eggs. So how did we do? Well let's go check it out. Take a look. Alright YouTube over here on my table I have a few containers full of Corydoras eggs and Corydoras fry. In this two and a half gallon tank that is where I have the Corydoras duplicarius and Corydoras Kanakis. Those were the two spawns that I had up in these two egg tumblers in my last video and we'll take a look at the results here in just a moment. To the right of that in this plastic tote here if you recall in my last video I mentioned that the CW49s were showing some signs of spawning and as it turned out that night they dropped about 50 eggs for me. So did we have any any luck or success hatching those? We'll check that out in a couple minutes as well. And since that last video was made 
My Corydoras duplicarius and axle rod, I had some small spawns, not too many eggs, maybe a dozen a piece. And uh, after these had hatched, I loaded up another egg tumbler, put it back in that 10 gallon tank, and these just started hatching today. So we'll take a look at those as well. All right, so let's first look at the Corydoras kanaki and the duplicarius. I don't know how we can do this. This is one of those times where you need three hands and you only have two. I'll lift this Java moss up. I don't know if you got a good look at that or how well this camera picked that up. We'll try it again just to make sure everybody saw it. Right over here especially. We had a really, really good hatch. Probably about a 90% hatch rate. And between the Corydoras Kanakis and the Duplicarius, I think we have anywhere from, I'm gonna say 65 to 70 fry swimming about in here. Now over here, again, the CW49s, they spawned that evening after I made that last video. So I picked those eggs. And let's take a look at what we have. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Hopefully this camera picks it up. So there's a fry right there. Another one, another one, another one, another one. And there's still some eggs in here that are literally still hatching. Like this one right there, I don't know if you saw that underneath. There it is, right there. This egg here still is still in the process of hatching. It has a little tail sticking out of it right now. So that's gonna be another one, but I counted earlier and we have about 10 or 12 CW49 fry in this tote here with a couple eggs still to hatch. So really, really excited about those results because the CW49 is or is known to be a really challenging Corydoras to spawn. Now for those that forget what these three species of Corydoras look like, let's go check out the adults real quick. All right, YouTube, these are the Corydoras Kanakis right here. And they actually had another spawn yet today. I see about half a dozen eggs in there. I'll pick those later this evening. Those are the Corydoras Kanakis. Up here are the Corydoras Duplicarius. Real beautiful fish. This is a favorite by a lot of people. Corydoras Duplicarius. And then the CW49s are over here. Just a real gorgeous Corydoras. All right, so those are the fish that we have in these two containers right here. And then again, in this container, there's more Duplicarius. And then there's a few Corydoras axelrodi in there as well. And these are the Corydoras axelrodi. So overall, this new method of hatching Corydoras has been very successful. And I'm going to continue until my luck strikes out, but so far the results have been fantastic. So why is this method working out so well when others cautioned me to use it? And why aren't the other more traditional methods working out? That's a good question. First, let's actually take a look at some of the other methods and talk about some of those other methods that people use to hatch Corydoras eggs. Now all these other methods are methods that I've used in the past and I've had mixed results, but usually I still have at least a 50% hatch rate up until this year. Now one of the most common methods is just taking one of these marina, I think they're now fluval, but one of these marina fry boxes, hanging it on the tank, sticking the eggs to the side of the tank. Now the downside to these types of fry boxes for hatching Corydoras eggs is there really isn't enough flow through there to keep the eggs clean. Now if you look in this fry box, you see all that mulm and all that stuff that's collected at the bottom. 
that eventually makes its way onto the Corydoras eggs and contaminates the eggs and probably is responsible for a lot of those eggs fungusing or, or going bad. Now, even if you put a little pre-filter on the intake of these fry boxes, a lot of that debris still makes its way into the fry box. So the biggest strike against these, this type of fry box and hatching Corydoras eggs is there's just simply not enough flow. Now, I've seen people use these in conjunction with an air stone, and I've tried that as well. I tried it earlier this year, but I still had really, really poor results. Now, another method that people will use these to hatch Corydoras eggs is they won't use that lift tube there. They'll keep that lift tube separate. They'll fill up this container full of tank water, drop an air stone in there, and then a piece of like Indian almond leaf or an alder cone or two, or maybe even a couple of cherry shrimp to help keep the eggs clean. Now, I've used those methods as well, except cherry shrimp. I don't have any shrimp in my fish room right now. And again, earlier this year, the results were the same. The eggs just went bad and um, I don't know if it was just the water volume or if maybe it was the fact that I used tank water and there were you know, some contaminants in there, maybe some free floating bacteria or fungi, I don't know. But I didn't really have good luck with that method this year either. All right, a couple more devices and methods that I've tried using this year to hatch out Corydoras eggs. First one here on the right, this is a German breeding ring. It floats inside the tank fills up with tank water. It has a really fine mesh screen on the bottom here. And uh, similar in design as the uh, Marina Fry boxes, it has a lift tube uh, that you hook up to an air pump and it pulls water up the lift tube and constantly supplies a flow of fresh water over the eggs or the fry inside the breeding ring. It does have a sponge pre-filter on it. However, like the marina fry boxes, this sponge still allows too many organics and pieces of debris and contaminants to get inside of this breeding ring and eventually the bottom will just be covered in a layer of organics regardless of how clean you think your tank is. So uh, I have tried using this. I had very, very little success using these. So I've stayed away from that moving forward. And then just an empty jar, you know, a flower vase or a pickle jar or something like that. I've used this, again, with limited success, just filling it up with, I've tried with tank water, I've tried with some RO, mixed with a little bit of tap water, toss in, you know, alder cones or a couple drops of methylene blue and an air stone. And again, for whatever reason, I don't know if it just wasn't enough water volume or what, um, I've had some success, but not really anything, um, you know, really noticeable. So uh, these are a couple other methods that I've tried this year hatching Corydoras eggs with uh, very little success. I've also used standalone uh, containers like this and actually this is Ian Fuller's preferred method and in, in at least what he says is to take you know small plastic totes like this fill it up with I think he says 35 to 45 uh, milliliters so three and a half to four and a half centimeters of water and um, put an air stone in in there in one end cover the container wait for them to hatch uh, I've done a similar or used a similar uh, technique but I was using these two and a half gallon tanks and I did have some minor success earlier in the year this year and then the last few times I tried it I had no success so don't know what changed or what happened um, could just be coincidence but with that being said this new method that I'm using so far I've had nothing but good results and I think it's a combination of a couple of things just the fact that it's a larger volume of water it's all clean water it's all RO with a little bit of tap water mixed in again for mineralization and buffering there's uh, no additional contaminants in, the, in there other than I did add again a couple of catapa leaves now what I also do when I pick eggs and I put them in here, I'll also add five milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to kill any free floating protozoa or bacteria or free floating fungi or any other organics that might have made their way in there. 
but you need to be careful using hydrogen peroxide. You don't want to use that if there's any fry present because um, that could definitely uh, cause some serious issues with the fry. So I only do that in the first couple of days um, before the eggs hatch. Normally they'll start hatching on day three, uh, if not by day four. So the first couple of days I'll add a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. But I also think it's just the way these egg tumblers are designed and it just allows for that nice clean flow of water over the eggs. They're not allowed to settle and collect on the bottom where they're touching each other and if you know one goes bad it spreads quickly to the others. But just the way that these keep the eggs suspended, pushed up against the side of the egg tumblers, um, that combined with the, the fresh water and the water volume, I think it's just working out well for me. So. I'm gonna to continue to use this method until um, my situation changes, which hopefully uh, doesn't happen. So real happy with the results that we're seeing so far with this technique. All right, now I mentioned I picked up a new group of corridors for the fish room. So let's go take a look at those real quick. And there they are. These are the black corridors. They're corridor Schultz eye black variation. They're not a naturally occurring color morph in the wild. These were line bred in the 90s in Germany. They're a lineage seven catfish or a lineage seven corridor. So they come from the same family or lineage as the green lasers, the orange lasers. So if your intent is breeding them, you just want to be careful to introduce them into a tank with other lineage seven corridors because they can crossbreed probably best to keep them in species only tanks like most uh, serious breeders do. Now these fish are often misidentified and misnamed in the hobby. A real common name that these are found in the hobby under is the uh, black Venezuelan or Corydorus Venezuelan black. These fish are neither related to Corydorus Venezuelanus nor do they come from Venezuela. They come from Peru. Now, according to Ian Fuller, uh, Ian Fuller in an article that he posted on scottcat.com, and I'm not sure of the date of the publication, but he did mention there is a darker variation of the Corydorus Venezuela, or Venezuelanus, but it's not commercially bred or available in the hobby. But again, I don't know the date of that article, but these are the Corydorus Schultzi black variation. I do get asked about this species quite a bit. A lot of people ask if I have them available and if they're for sale, etc., etc. I've never had them in my fish room until now. So they can be quite expensive, not easy to source. And when you find them, you'll see them often at $25 to $30 a piece. But we picked up 16 of these. I'll keep 10 here. The other six will be heading over to my brother's fish room so we can uh, have some redundancy and diversify the risk a little bit, but hopefully we'll have them breeding by fall, but really excited to add these fish to the fish room here at TM Aquatics, the Corridor Schultzi Black, and looking forward to working with this species. All right, you two, before we end this video, I think it's important for me to say that I am not, nor have I ever claimed to be a Corridorus expert. I am definitely not at the level of people like Ian Fuller, Rob McClure, Eric Bodrock, and some of those guys. I am simply a hobbyist, no different than you, sharing the experiences here in my fish room with my fish and my fish only. Now I've talked about a lot of the techniques that are used to hatch corridors, techniques that I've used in the past, and talked about a lot of those techniques not working for me here in my fish room. I've had to experiment with some different ways to hatch Corydoras eggs and I finally found a technique that seems to be working okay and I'm going to continue doing it. Now if you use one of those other techniques that I talked about that have failed for me, whether it's a breeder ring or a fry box or whatever, and that works for you, good, continue doing that. Use whatever works for you. But if not and you're having some challenges like I've had this year, don't be afraid to experiment with different ways and hopefully I've been able to share a couple ideas. So anyways, with that being said, again, take everything I said as my opinion based on my experiences with my fish here at TM Aquatics. Thanks for understanding. All right, YouTube, well, there you have it. Looks like we finally have this Corydorus issue figured out, at least for the short term, as we're starting to finally see some success and some nice hatches. 
Anyways, tell me what you think about that approach. I'd also like to hear from you about the new Corridor Schultzide Black here that we have at TM Aquatics. Is that a Corridor that you like? Is that a Corridor that you would keep? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. Anyways, I greatly appreciate each and every one of you taking time out of your day to watch one of my videos. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop those down below. Hit the like button on your way out. I hope to iron your subscription. And until the next one, thanks again, and we'll catch you all later.